158 in the African American Heritage Hymnal, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I'm going to sing that together. to receive you on this day. For our Lord, we recognize that all that we do and say in this place on today is because you have made it possible. You woke us up this morning and started us on our way. And so we find ourselves in pews ready to give you worship and to praise you. So come, Spirit of a living God, come and move in this place like never before. Come, Spirit of a living God, and we shall be careful to give your name our honor and all of the praise. Come, Spirit of a living God, and the people of God say, Amen, amen. and Amen. Our next selection is special. This lovely young lady, uh, to show you things that you have been through during this pandemic, uh, Gail Shield. She's going, to, she's going to sing for you now, come Sunday. And about four or five, well, four months ago, Gail was in the hospital. She had triple bypass heart surgery. She came to look at it now. Come Sunday.
We now will prepare our hearts and mind for the, for the pastoral prayer here at Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ. And we are a believing people. We, we believe in going on. Amen. Amen. How many of you know that if you woke up this morning, God has given you the ability of hope. And with that hope, we know that we can press on. Come on, I need to hear you today. You know that we can press on. So to bring us all together. I feel like going on. I feel Some of us come bruised and broken hearted. Some of us come after struggling all week long with physical, emotional, and miserable, mental conditions. Some of us come, Lord, because we've had some ups and we've had some downs. But however we come on today, Lord, we come with a determination, Lord, to to see you as our God and we as your people. We come thanking you and praising you, Lord, because you have kept us through the heat of the day. You've sent clouds to, to shield a scorching sun. And in the midnight hour, you gave us a star in which to follow when many of us had lost our way. And for this, we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you kept us. In a reasonable portion of health, you kept us. Clothed and in right mind, you kept us. So we show up today, Lord, just to say thank you. We come, Lord, because we know that whatever we're going through on this day, we can look towards the hills from which cometh our help, knowing that our help cometh from you. And we say thank you. Then, Lord, we want to praise you. We praise you, Lord, because you are God and God all by yourself. We praise you, Lord, because in all of our comings and goings, you still kept the, the earth spinning appropriately. You still kept the winds blowing, you still kept the sun shining, the moon and the stars at night. You still held it together for us and we praise you for that, Lord. Lord, we praise you because in all things it is written in the scriptures, you say, give thanks. And so today we just praise you. Lord, as we come thanking you and praising you, we come today praying, oh Lord, for a healing for the sick and shut in on our list. Many, oh God, have gone through some illnesses, God, and some have had operations. Others find themselves laid out on their beds of affliction. But we are the people of God, and so we speak it into the atmosphere, a word of healing. We believe so much in the power of God and the healing power of deliverance that all we would do but, but speak it, and it is so. So on today, Lord, we ask that you stop by those who are on the beds of affliction, those who are 
in the convalescent homes, those who are struggling in the body, anywhere, those who find themselves awakening in unusual and strange places and don't know how to get there. We're praying for the Lord. And Lord, we're praying for ourselves. For Lord, we've done some things we shouldn't have done, been some places we hadn't have been just going, and said some things we hadn't have been to say. But because of your grace and your mercy, you've forgiven us. And here we find ourselves facing another day's journey. Lord, we pray for our pastor. We pray for this church. Lord, you've been so good to our pastor. Whatever he's going through in the physical, Lord, you, you renewed him. And now you've given him the strength to run on just a little further. Lord, we praise you for each and every member of this church. But we've been planted here for many years doing the ministry you've called us to do. And we ain't tired yet. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the city. We pray for this country and we're praying for this world. I feel like going on. I feel
selected for today says, I will let God's peace infuse every part of today. As the chaos swirls and life's demands pull at me on all sides, I will breathe in God's peace that surpasses all understanding. He has promised that he would set within me a peace too deeply planted to be affected by unexpected or exhausting demands. And that was written by someone named Wendy Monet. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, we're going to pass the peace, but you're not going to move around. You're going to sit there and do like this and do like that. And welcome, welcome, welcome. Pass the peace. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm so happy to, uh, you know, in spite of the virus and all, uh, see such a nice crowd coming out today. Uh, we uh, uh, did uh, some uh, virtual concerts uh, last year, and uh, uh, there are two numbers that we want, especially we've never done them before, and we're going to try them tonight, this evening, uh, and um, they in relationship to George Floyd, Floyd's uh, funeral. These two songs were performed at uh, George Floyd's funeral. One song, uh, I'm, it, we're going to do tonight, a change is going to come by Sam Good. Brandon Thomas will tell you a little bit about it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Sam Cook, as many of you probably know already, was a very popular uh, singer during the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, he was uh, what we would probably call today one of the first crossover artists because he appealed to black and white audiences alike. And uh, his music was sort of filled with music. He did songs like uh, Wonderful World and uh, Cupid and uh, You Send Me. But this was also the time of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and many activists and, and uh, as artists, or, um, or uh, not necessarily artists, kept pushing him to do something meaningful to the movement. Uh, but he was reluctant to do that. You know, sort of like, uh, I guess, we can relate to a little more modern times when, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, Michael Jordan was asked to support uh, Harvey Gantt in a uh, run for uh, Senate in North Carolina several seconds ago. And he said, well, uh, you know, Harvey Gantt was a black candidate. He said, well, white people buy shoes too. So he just said, I'm not going to get involved in politics. And that's kind of the attitude that Sam Cooke had. But a couple of things occurred during, the during 1963 that really affected him. One of which was uh, when uh, Bob Dylan uh, recorded the song uh, um, uh, Blowing in the Wind, which was sort of an anthem uh, that reached down to the, the, the issue of, uh, of black people being uh, oppressed in this country. And Sam Cooke said, well, you know, he's just this white guy doing something that maybe I should be saying, that I should be doing. And then the second thing, the thing that really tipped it off was uh, in November of that year, 63, uh, Sam was on tour with his, with his band in, in the South, and he booked uh, a hotel room at the Holiday Inn in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, for himself and his wife. But when they arrived there, and the hotel manager saw that they were black, they told him, well, the, 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 the reservation was canceled because there were no vacancies. And that set him off. And he just, I mean, that, that really set him off. He protested vividly uh, and eventually left. And the police traced and tracked him down and arrested him for serving peace. So that next month he went into the studio and he recorded, uh, or, or he wrote rather, the song uh, Changes on the Come. And, and the following month in January, he recorded it. And it was first performed live on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson uh, about a week later. And uh, it became, actually, he, 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 Sam Cook died in December of, of 64. He was, he, was, he was killed in December of 64. And after that, the song took on a life of its own and it became the anthem of the Civil Rights Movement. So that's sort of the back story of the song. The river out in the road. 
to God. Now we invite you to spend one more additional hour with us during the week. You're invited to our Bible study on Tuesdays at 12 noon. And we are currently studying the uh, prophet Hosea. Uh, and so you can join in that worship. Our spiritual grounding session is on Fridays at 12 noon. All these gatherings take place through the GoToMeeting platform. And on Wednesday morning at 6 a.m., there's a dial-up and power-up prayer line that's led by Reverend uh, Garrett Jordan, and we give thanks for his leadership on that line. Now, all that's listed in Plymouth's newsletter. If you want to get on Plymouth's newsletter list, you can just email the church and ask to be on the list, and you'll be on the list. And that's Plymouth Congregational at Yahoo.com. Plymouth Congregational at Yahoo.com or directly to me at G-S-H-A-G-L-E-R at Verizon.net. And this is a part of our 140th anniversary celebration, uh, Bob. <laughs> Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ came into being in 1881. And, uh, and we, the original building was on 17th and P Street, Northwest. We moved here in 1961 and began worship on this corner. But if you go down there, I think it's a CVS down there now. And no, and no sign of the church. Right? So we, we know how that goes in a city. But we need to keep our own history alive so that people understand uh, uh, that there is and has been and will be a presence in Washington, D.C. So I just want to give thanks and remind uh, each of you that we are celebrating 140 years of ministry and mission, and we give thanks to God for that because God has brought us this far by God's grace. Now, is, uh, as it comes to this time, I think of giving. Is that right, Bobby? No, not yet. Not yet. Bobby said it was to hold off on the giving yet. But y'all know what's coming, right? <laughs> so that as Bobby and friends lift up that music, you know what's getting ready to come. Right? And so don't be hiding the big bills and the big checks. You might as well go find them. Make sure that you make the kind of giving that is worthy of the way God has blessed you. Bobby Felton, friends. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, yes, yes, uh, uh, now another announcement I'd like to make. Uh, if you notice, one of our main singers is missing today, and he's Dick Smith, he's been with us for all these years. But he's at home, uh, he's not, he's kind of under the weather, so he was unable to perform. This next number uh, is, it was, it was Dick's favorite number. Jesus is the best, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to him. But if the last minute when we found out that Dick could not perform, our loving vocalist, uh, Gail Sip, stepped in and said she could do the number, and she's uh, doing it for the first time. But before we play this, I, I, I must say that for for over 10 years, we've had a piano player, um, Ben Smith, who played with us. He's also ill, and he could not perform with us today. But thank God that we have a replacement on piano that's is, is absolutely one of the best piano players in this whole area. We had one rehearsal yesterday. She came in, and she sat in with us, and she sat read this music just like it was nothing. Just like you're reading a book or something. This ain't a book, man. Stand up, man. Stand up, let me see you. Stand up. Very good piano. Thank you, Amy, so much. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me, Gail Ship.
Hey, give us a Jesus being the best thing that ever happened to us. Because we know that God has blessed us and given to us, whether we want to admit it or not. The reality is you're here today by the grace and mercy of God. God watched over you through the night. And God brought you through danger, toil, and snake. I've been dealing with cancer treatment on my throat. And God has continued to bring me through, open up the door, make the way. God has been a healer, a redeemer, a sustainer. And I've got to give praise to God this morning because I ain't worried about a thing as long as my hand is in God's hand. And God's hand is upon me. And so I rejoice today. I mean, I rejoice today. All right. You know, uh, folk think I'm worried about it. I ain't worried about a dog. some praise to the Lord and I can't give what God can give. I can't do what God can do.
can also give by going to Plymouth's website at Plymouth-UCC.org, www.Plymouth-UCC.org. There are instructions on the other methods of giving that you can utilize. You can give by cash app. Our cash tag is dollar sign Plymouth DC, dollar sign Plymouth DC. Or you can give by Givelify. Givelify, you can find us as Plymouth Congregational Church in Washington, D.C. So we urge that you make your contributions through those methods and other methods, and however you're comfortable with giving your money away, do it, give your money away, because if you try to hold on to it, I got news for you, there is no safe deposit boxes at the graveyard. <laughs> Might as well use it for the glory of God right now. Let us join in our doxology together.
and fraternity by having her husband come home from the front lines of the battle in hopes that he will sleep with his wife and her pregnancy would be construed as belonging to Uriah and not David. But Uriah was unwilling to violate the ancient kingdom rule applying to warriors in active service. Rather than go home to his own bed, he preferred to remain with the palace troops in solidarity and out of respect for those in the field and those at battle. As David's plan did not work, he penned this note and had Uriah deliver his own death sentence to the commander on the battlefield. For as you heard, the note said, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. Now there are a number of things that we are exposed to in the very human and flawed story of David that we fail to see in the enlarged and mythologized versions of David. We have glossed over the flaws of David declaring despite those flaws, God is able to take someone as flawed and wretched as David and use him for the kingdom of God and the people of God. This is true, but that is not the essence of the stories surrounding David. I'm going to tell you today that most of what you have read or heard about in reference to David is embellished, mythologized, and therefore we miss the lessons of what it means when someone thinks that they are above the law and even seemingly above God in instances and at glimpses. In David, we see a person who is the king and believes that he is the law that his office epitomizes it, and that decency, morality, or ethics only apply when it is convenient. It kind of reminds me of what we have gone through in the last few years with the last so-called president. And there are people who continue to embellish and sanitize and mythologize Trump as a symbol for the good old days of racism and white supremacy, excusing his sins as being an example that God can take a flawed person like David or Trump for the kingdom of God and the people of God. What a cry. There are biblical writers, historians, and theologians that seek to highlight and fashion David as a symbol of the golden era of Israel because David pulls the tribes together and creates a unified kingdom that only lasts for one generation, however. But it was such a moment of success and accomplishment that people looked to the era as the good old days of hope and stability and protection. The mega people, are the same kind of people by mythologizing events such as January 6th when folks were just on a tour of the Capitol concocting stories and constructing stories that attempt to revive from their perspective the good old days of racial suppression. This encounter between David and Bathsheba And the resulting sin and lapses in judgment and decency caused one writer, David J. Zucker, to write that Bathsheba is a victim of power rape. Y'all hear me? Obviously not something to be construed as love or even lust for that matter. Another writer, David D. Coogan, writes that the Bathsheba incident leads to a shift in the book's perspective. Afterwards, David is largely at the mercy of events rather than directing them. He is no longer able to control his family and ends up being overthrown by Absalom, if you know the story. And in 2 Samuel chapter 13, the story of David's son, Amnon, rapes of his sister Tamar, 
told so soon after the incident of Bathsheba, it seems to draw a parallel between the sexual misconduct of the father and of the son. Also, because we don't look at the story and people give to us the myth of the story, we miss some man in the story. Who is Bathsheba? Bathsheba literally means the daughter of Sheba. Where's Sheba? Huh? Ethiopia. And her husband is a Hittite. So you got an Ethiopian and a Hittite, and you got David who devises to seduce her and to murder her husband. Because we don't look at the story because we've been fed the myth of the story rather than look at the dynamic of the story. And what I want to point out is that this is what happens when someone thinks that they are above the law. Not subject to the rules as everyone else is. And believe that ethics is situational. And morality is a matter of what you can get away with. We have too much of that going on today. David was the king. And David had to be reminded a few times, often by the prophet Nathan, that there is a God who has not abdicated any of God's power or rule to David or to anyone else. God is God. God is on the throne and human beings may sit on a human-made throne, but God is still on the throne of creation. You may be in the White House, but that is not God's house. Don't confuse the two. You might be president, but that doesn't mean that you have the omnipotence or omnipresence of God, and there might be a Congress, but Congress cannot convene a chorus of angels or address the heavenly host. Only God can do that, and there is no entity under the sun that is above God. The country, the society, and the world would be a much better place if we consistently humbled ourselves before God and acknowledge that God is the one in control and not us. I think of the politicians who lie and who know that they are lying and the people that look to a narcissistic and pathological liar for leadership who buy into Purinah and callously attempt to victimize people of color and immigrants, and LGBTQIA people, and erode the right to vote, and dare to still try to call that a democracy. I think of all the examples that are presently before us that tells us that people need to humble themselves and pray. People need to get on their knees before God, and people need to ask the Lord for forgiveness. We need to remain humble and ground. Now after Solomon, David's son, had finished building the temple that David could not build, God still reminded Solomon that he and his people were not to be so arrogant, thinking that they have achieved something and thinking that they are above accountability. God says that locusts may still come and eat the crops. There still might be a drought, and pestilence may come upon the land. And you cannot do anything about that but humble yourselves and pray. So in those verses in 2 Chronicles, we hear his warning and hear this advice. If my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. These stories about David are stories of a tribal leader, probably an illiterate tribal leader, and definitely not the writer of any of the Psalms. Let me repeat that. 
Because I get tired of hearing folks say, oh, David was going through this when David wrote this song. He did not write any of the songs. The songs are instruments of liturgy that was used in the temple and therefore written by priests and scribes. And David did not write any of it, but it works if you're going to look back to the golden era and say, remember the era of David when he brought together the kingdom? Let us try to get back to the good old days where his folks say right now, remember the antebellum South? Let us get back to the days of plantations and put people of color in their place so that we can raise them. The same type of mentality is afoot in the scripture as well as in the society before us. And the scripture helps us to see it if we strip away all of the veneer that exists and get down to the actual historical facts of the text. We may get away with our conduct we understand in the text. And we may get away with our actions we understand in the text for a little while. But a whole host of trouble awaits when we're not humbled and we're not grounded. Being humble simply means that we recognize that there is something greater than ourselves. There is something greater than us that we are accountable to. But what I am talking about is not humility and accountability to a company or to an organization, or even to a country, or to a political party, or any other humanly constructed manifestation. But what I'm talking about is something higher than any of that, because I'm talking about being humble and accountable to God. God's judgment will catch up with you. Yes. So live right in the first place and seek to be right and to be righteous. God will ultimately hold you accountable. So treat others right. Get on your knees often to remind yourself that it is the Lord, that it is the Lord who will lift you up. And anytime anyone wants to praise you, give the glory and the honor to God. You know, and sometimes every now and then I, I may preach a sermon that I like and everybody else likes. Everybody comes and praises me for preaching a good sermon. Don't praise me. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Spirit of God that is moving in the world. I recognize that I'm only a vehicle. You're only a vehicle. And so we've got to remain humble and grounded in the Lord in order to be a proper vessel that God can use and you have. Don't get so puffed up and arrogant thinking that just because you went to this school or that school or that you belong to that fraternity or that fraternity or that you're a native Washingtonian or you came from something. Don't get puffed up with those types of superficial things. Remain humble and grounded in the law. For the God who makes a way. This is part of what it means to be humble. And part of what it means to be grounded. And as it reminds us in Romans chapter 12 verses 14 to 18. It attempts to teach us a lesson about humility. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be hardy, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, So far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. David needed a lesson in ethics and morality and humility and accountability. And the 
prophet Nathan confronts him in his wrongdoing, not just once, but numbers of times. Even the child that Bathsheba gives birth to dies before a name is chosen. David had to be chastised over and over again. And he needed to be reminded that there is only one God, and he's not it. Only God is God. Amen. This nation needs a lesson in ethics also, a lesson in justice, a lesson in living right and seeking to do right. But the only way we will get there as a nation is to humble ourselves, confess that we are not all that, and hold ourselves to God and God alone. This is that. Jesus came to teach us that. Jesus came to teach us about how neighbor, caring for the poor and the stranger, regarding the people who have been disregarded, understanding what the love of God is about, and daring to emulate that love of neighbor to neighbor and stranger to stranger. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, Jesus teaches and warns, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He reminds us of the rich ruler who wanted to inherit the kingdom, inherit eternal life. And Jesus starts to tell him how he can inherit eternal life. But that man already knows the secrets to eternal life. And Jesus says, okay, then give what you have to the poor. And come and follow me. But it said that the man walked away sad. Because he could not. Because as it says in Luke chapter 18 verse 23, he was very rich. The man was self-centered, self-absorbed, inflated and filled with himself. And God demanded humility and accountability to God and accountability to goodness. So sisters and brothers, I leave you with this message. Get humble. I'm going to leave you with this message. Get humble. I'm going to leave you with this message. Pray. I'm going to leave you with this message. Get humble and pray. I'm going to leave you with this message. Give the glory to God. It doesn't belong to you. Give glory to God. It doesn't belong to you. Do the right thing in all times, in all seasons. Do a good thing, even and particularly when it is not convenient to do so. Get on your knees every now and then and to remind yourself that you are not all that. You're not all that big. You're not all that tough. You're not all that tall. Get down on your knees and thank God for seeing you through another moment, another day. Not by your might, but by the grace of God. Not by your strength, but by the mercy of God. And because of the love of God, we acknowledge that you're still here. And to remind ourselves that it's all in the Lord's hands anyway. I can do nothing about it but humble myself, humble ourselves, and pray and give thanks to the Lord for God can make a way. If we let. God can make a way if we let. God can make a way if we don't get in God's way. God can make a way if we don't slam the door in God's face to recognize that we did not make ourselves but we were made by the master craft we were made by God get on your knees and pray and thank the Lord every day for the breath that you breathe into your lungs and the blood that rushes warm through your veins I pray that somebody may have heard a message today and know that you need to humble yourself and pray if somebody today knows you need to get into that flow of being 
saved of receiving God's mercy. If you're not yet in that place where you're fully able to receive God's mercy, this is a time to come forth and pray about it and ask the Lord to fill you with God's mercy, to ask the Lord to fill you with God's goodness. If you're not yet part of a community of faith, you need to get into a community of faith. The doors of this church are also open to receive you. But most of all, let us get into the presence of God and ask the Lord to fill us for the journey ahead. To fill us for the journey ahead. Because when we humble ourselves, Brother Bradley, we get a different insight. God allows us to see things that we ordinarily would not see. Because we begin to see through the Spirit of God to humble yourself. If that's you, and you know that you need to be filled today with the presence and the power, the healing, the mercy of God, I invite you forth as we join in the singing, a closer walk with thee, just a closer walk with thee. If that's you, and you want to come forth to receive prayer, I invite you to come forth to receive prayer. Deacons, come forth uh, to help anybody who wants to pray and pray. Just stand in each one of the eyes. Just to let somebody know that we're here and that we are a praying people. We humble ourselves in the presence of God and pray. And we know that God is able to make a way and open a door to heal a body, to restore us. God is able to fill us if we just remind ourselves that we need to be humble and grounded in the Lord. Let us stand together as Bobby Felton and friends play just a closer walk with them.
Our next selection now, we like to, this is a selection that is known all over the world. Uh, we like to have everybody join in with us on this next song, Every Praise.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank everyone for being with us today. To um, our, I think the band came out pretty good for the first time. I want to give thanks to all these musicians. Uh, I would like to say uh, that God has blessed me with a, a, a group of great, 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 great musicians in all the way. And uh, we just had one rehearsal yesterday, and uh, they, put, they put it together real good. We want to close out with something very, something very, very special that I heard uh, again during uh, the Floyd funeral. Uh, a number of BB Wine put out. This uh, become a really a standard, and it's my arrangement that I did on this uh, on uh, Black Lives Matter. We're going to close out with that. Thanks for the bass there for reminding me. Uh, main thing, introduce the band. Michael Thomas on yeah. 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 Third shot, after that. Yeah. Yeah. fans on tennis shot over there. Yeah. And the band on guitar, David yeah. Cole. Yeah. Our great yeah. brother, Greg Holloway. Yeah. And the, the gentleman who put, helped put the band together to help me with everything, bass player, Wes Bowles. And our beautiful piano player, Andy Cornell. And uh, although we are missing Dick Smith, but we have with us Teal Ade, Teal Tim, and White Young's lawyer, the great Peter lawyer, the man right here, Bradley Thomas. So we're going to go out with everybody in a. Uh, 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 we've got one. We've got and, I, and I hope to see. Uh, uh, we've, we've got one, Bobby. Our fearless leader, <laughs> the yeah. Maestro, Bobby Sullivan. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, thanks to Rip Hagley again for bringing us back. And I hope hope we'll see you again in our traditional uh, Christmas Eve. I hope so. You know. See you on Christmas Eve. Okay, we're going to close out with Black Lives Matter. Tomorrow to see his eyes looking back at me with that smile, his possibilities and our plans don't change.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.